gonna jump right into our landscape section. And I'm gonna say that we um, by far had the most questions in this general kind of broad landscape category um, these past few months. So we've picked we picked around to find the, the ones that we feel like are most important that we wanna make sure that we address with you all today. And again, if you have something that pops into your head, be sure and put that in the question answer and we'll try to get those, get those answered. Um, all right, so let's put our thinking hats on y'all. The first one I'm gonna throw out there, uh, it's kind of a two questions that went together. So we'll start with the first one and then we'll just kind of piggyback on with the next one. So this gardener says, I'm confused about fall cleanup. <laughs> and I feel her confusion because we get different messages, right? She says now, or he, I'm not sure. He says, now everyone is saying to leave your leaves. Don't cut plants back. What about cutting back things like hostas and peonies? What about leaves from evergreen magnolias? What about leaves from deciduous trees? I'm so confused. So let's help them get maybe get a little more focused and maybe that will help with some of the confusion. Um, so Lucas, do you want to start us off with some thoughts? Yeah, and you can see all the memes coming across Facebook and some of the gardening sites right now encouraging us to leave our leaves. Now, I see pros and cons to this, and I don't think there's going to be any correct answer to this because we get asked this question a lot. Some of our diseases actually overwinter in some of these old leaves. I can understand leaving some leaves for the pollinators because we do have some types of bees, wasps, and, and other but butterflies that will overwinter in some of those leaves. So I can understand that. But if we've got Cercospora, if we've got powdery mildew and things like that, those are leaves that we don't even want to compost because we'll actually vector that for next year. When you're talking about hostas and peonies and things like that, I'm a daylily person. I clean up that foliage because we have aphids that will overwinter and sometimes that foliage. So I don't actually, I have hostas too. I'll trim all those back pretty much to stubs and the actual crown whenever frost is actually killing them. My hostas are still kind of up right now. My daylilies are still kind of up right now. So I've still got probably another month and a half till I go through. So if I've had issues with insects or diseases, I'm going to clean up those leaves, okay? Um, but if I haven't, I probably will leave them. But for the most part, I normally clean them up because I usually have aphid issues on daily leaves. You know, Lucas, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because the past several years, I'm like, why do I have so many aphids on my brand new daylily, you know, leaves when they start coming out? And it's because I've been leaving the you know the old foliage i'm sure of it once you put those two pieces of the pu the puzzle together for me so thank you that was very informative um, and and then i'm going to throw in a couple other reasons why um th and this is just my my personal take what i do as well i do clean some things up because i like my garden to still have a sense of um you know just looking a little more organized, right? Um, but I leave a lot of things as well, especially things like seed heads that the birds, um, a lot of our different birds might be using. I like to leave the seed heads of my echinacea, rudbeckias. I've got um, just a number of different things. I'll, I'll leave some of those, right, for nature to claim, as well as leaving the stalks of some plants because we have a lot of native bees that need those hollow cavities to nest in and, and do things like that, a, a, a habitat, if you will, for the winter for them. So, you know, doing some cleanup is completely fine, but then also leaving some there um, for nature is, is beneficial as well. And so I know that part of the discussion is really focused on in a landscape, like ornamental bed type situation. But if we're talking about lawns, Mitchell, do you have any thoughts on um, leaving leaves on lawns versus removing those leaves from lawns? Well, if, if you accumulate enough leaves so that you create a blanket that will obstruct sunlight, then that's not any good because those are green plants and you've got to get the sunlight to put the uh, And you can also reduce airflow to those. So, you know, chopping the leaves up, raking them up, uh, using them as mulch on other plants after you chop them up, putting them in the compost pile is, uh, you know, is a good thing to do. And if you are, if you overseed it, like I 
of course, is and you've got those young seedlings there, you're trying to get them uh, a chance to grow through the thick layer leaves. And you know, it's a lot of competition, so you know, you're better off. Uh, now, you, again, you don't have to remove them, you will chop them up, and they'll break down much faster. And that's a good way to recycle whatever nutrients there are going to be a little bit of nutrient in there, so you can recycle that, and then you know, that, that will help them to break down faster. To, to add to whatever the organic matter content is going to be uh, in that soil layer. Yeah, I was I was going to add that I feel like this is the perfect time, Andrea, to point out that we that that fulfills one of those reuse, reuse, recycle um, objectives in the Tennessee Smart Arts program that we promote. Right, so we talk a lot about repurposing leaves. Um, mulching those leaves or even just you know if you have them on a, a lawn type setting let's blow those in to those ornamental settings right and just let them decompose naturally and, and create another layer of organic mulch because we know how beneficial it is to have organic mulches um, in planting areas it just helps create that richness and improve soil structure over time prevents erosion, lots of good, good benefits that we can get from leaves. So, uh, right. So I hope that kind of cleared up that question. And uh, the short answer for that is there are times when you might need to do some leaf cleanup. And there are times when maybe leaving them or moving them to a different area could be beneficial as well. Oh, I love that discussion. That was so much fun. So now here's the piggyback question that kind of goes along with that. So this gardener says that they have a ton of leaves, right, from mature oak trees that are falling around the house. Um, they pick some of those up at first. They mulch those with the cyclone rake. Um, let's see. Um, they talk a little more about how these leaves tend to be perfect for compost. Um, let's see. Uh, is there any, and their question is, they were kind of setting the scene, right? So we knew what was going on in their garden. And then the question is, is there any problem with using these leaves to make compost? And there's not. No, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful source um, of, of browns, we'll call them, um, to add to your compost bins. And I'd say that the caution there would be what Lin what Lucas mentioned as far as leaves that possibly have any kind of disease on them. But really that that's going to be more important when we're talking about plants and those ornamental type plantings. We generally don't have diseases of oak trees that are going <laughs> to survive a, you know, a compost problem or, or a, as our temperatures, you know, raise and break that material down. So great source of brown material for compost. Um, it, yeah. I might add one thing, just be careful about application right at the crown of the plants, of course, you know, we don't want to have that contact in contact with actual tree trunks or any woody ornamental shrub trunks. Good point. Good point. Don't pile that up on the base of on the base and of your trunk. Especially if they're not already broken down because the compost does create heat. So that would be an issue I would be nervous about if they were too excessively applied at the base of the plants. Excellent point. Excellent point. And I'm going to throw out there one time I just uh, put a bunch of leaves in these big, huge, black, heavy plastic bags. And I kept thinking that I would, you know, take them to get rid of them. And then I never did. And I went to open up the bags the next spring. Guess what happened? They were compost. <laughs> they just did it on their own. And I was like, oh, look at this wonderful, rich, rich uh, amendment that I have. So lots of, of excellent things that leaves can do for us. And this you is know, the time you have to talk about that. Uh, folks that remember a guy named Herb Lester he used to be uh, Asian in Davidson County and he was the regional director here in Central Region for a long time. And his way of dealing with uh, tree leaves in the fall is exactly what you did, put them in, in garbage bags, but now he would wet them down pretty good and throw a couple of handfuls of when you could still buy them on your nitrated bags and throw them in there and yeah he just had bags of, of uh, ready to use compost a few months later and that was a very simple process for him to use all right good good conversation so here here is one more that i thought would be uh well another one that i wanted to make sure that we mentioned today and it said there a zill, and this was submitted in October. So, you know, about a month, uh, you know, sometime in October. My azaleas and hydrangeas 
um, have spots on them. <laughs> they have stopped blooming. The leaves are yellowing. Portions of the azaleas have died. It could be two separate problems, um, but the plants are in the same space. So what are your thoughts? And I'm just going to jump in there and say that these are most likely two different causal agents are causing things to go wrong on these plants. You know, diseases of azalea are not going to be shared with um, hydrangeas, and they don't even have the same, what we would call like key pests associated with each of those plants. So in my opinion, I think that we probably have two different things going on. I wouldn't worry too much about the leaf spotting because leaves, all the leaves are about to fall off of your hydrangeas. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you've got some, some issues with dieback on azalea, I would be sure to try to focus in and see if maybe you had azalea lace bug. Um, some damage going on there that can cause some discoloring of the leaves where they get kind of yellowy, kind of uh, sickly looking and infest infestations can be so heavy that the leaves do fall off. So that might be what's going on there um, with your azaleas. But those are just you, any thoughts. Yeah, you can also, um, azaleas are very pH dependent. They're related to blueberries. Um, and so if your pH is too high, you could also see yellowing on the leaves due to iron deficiency because uh, they can't take up the iron that they need. So that's another thing. If you haven't done a soil test, it might be good to check and see uh, where your pH is sitting in your uh, flower beds. Yes, good and point, good point. One thing I always tell people too, if you in this here on the plateau, if you've got azaleas and they're not looking good, look for lace bug because lace bug, yeah. And a lot of people, novice people, will confuse it with a fungal disease, and those lace bug will be on the underside of the leaves. So, you know, really do your diligence in terms of looking and, and, and problem solving with those. And you might not actually see the insects at this time of year, but when you flip those leaves over, look for little bitty black tar spots, like they just look like little shiny dots on the underside of the leaf, and that is their excrement right, from while they've been feeding. They've also been doing that deed. So that's another sign that could help you positively identify that or not. So good questions. Um, and the time to treat for those would be early spring. And I have a feeling that we'll probably come back to that, that question early next year. So, um, oh, here was a few more. I know Taylor and I talked about this a little earlier. We had a question about uh, a gardener had um, some perennial milkweeds that they had either, I don't know if they started them for seed, from seed, but they were in a pot, they were a year old, and they were asking about planting. Is Could they plant them at this time of year? Taylor, do you want to tell us what your thoughts are on as far as planting and perennials? Yes, and if the person is on here, I'm sorry, that was September, and it is now November, but we still have a planting window for perennials as long as uh, and Celeste and I were talking about as long as the ground isn't frozen and you can uh, dig in there and plant, um, you can still get some of those, like we talked about earlier, get some of those plants in um, before we get really cool and have some root growth and establishment. Um, and that'll get them geared up and ready before the uh, we get really warm next year. Um, and something else we talked about is, you know, if you're if you're starting from seed and maybe you've got annuals and things like that, some of your more tender uh, flowers. We want to wait until next spring after our chance of frost has passed. Um, but with the perennials, we still have a window where you can plant. Yeah, I'm all about I'm all about doing some planting in the fall as long as we can remember to keep them watered. If we have a a dry you know fall, um, which we, we are having right now. <laughs> you know, it's strange. I guess it depends on where you are, but we've had some pretty timely rains here in West Tennessee, maybe like one nice little shower a week for the past three weeks or so. So I'm I'm pretty happy with the moisture levels in my gardens at the moment. So Okay, don't be bragging, Celeste. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we're supposed to get some more rain tomorrow. I, I haven't looked to see if that's supposed to cover the whole state, but um, we're talking tornado level winds, I believe. It's supposed to be pretty windy. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. We'll do, we'll do another one. Let me pick out. We had so many y'all that I just, I'm sorry, we're not going to have time to address them all, but 
a question here. Oh, this was a pretty interesting one to me. So I'm going to read you all the whole question. I have two properties that border the Cherokee National Forest. I've looked but can't find any resources on things that the Forest Service would prefer I not do in the garden. Example, <laughs> plants that they are worried will spread and become problematic. Uh, things like that. Obviously, planting as many native species as possible is ideal, but is there any other information available to help me plan my new gardens? Thanks so much on any help that you can offer. So I will say that I do not think that they are taking an active approach on what they would prefer people not to do <laughs> on property that is not theirs. So I don't think you'll find anything on that, but we do have lots of resources to help you learn more about, well, identify number one, and then learn more about invasive exotic pests of Tennessee. And one of those resources is the Tennessee Pest Plant Council. Well, they might have changed their name. Are they still called the Pest They're Plant invasive. Council? Invasive, invasive Pest Plant Council. Plant Council. Um, so just, uh, you know, look them up online. They um, have a huge list. They denote things that are just kind of like maybe like on a threatening level, right? So they're not considered um, invasive at this moment, but they're kind of keeping them under watch um, and some different levels of, of, of uh, we'll call threat, I guess. So that would be a good place to start just to kind of get yourself a little more informed on invasives and things that we might wanna stay away from and then how to identify those on your property. And then you could take steps to remove them, you know, from the environment. So that and would the be resources. Oh, sorry, go, ahead, Taylor. go ahead, Taylor. The resource gives you common invasives and then replacements. If you, let's say you have them and you like the look of them, they'll give replacement options that offer that similar look, vibe, whatever for your landscape. Um, so you can make better choices, but still maintain the look that you like. Yes. Yes, that's important for sure. And, and also, Celeste, just a quick, I don't know where they're at next to the Cherokee National Forest, but and get to know your district rangers, uh, find out where those uh, district um, offices are and develop that relationship because kind of depending on where you're at, um, there can be different threat levels and, and that kind of thing going on. And those um, district offices are usually chock full of some of those additional resources too. Oh, good. Yeah, you could just go there and, and stock up on what they have to offer. Excellent. And I want to hype up some of our resources. We have some wonderful plant list resources. If you're looking at what should I plant, we have a great perennials for Tennessee, annuals and biennials for Tennessee, um, more coming out uh, all the time. So make sure you look on the, the resources uh, for what to plant for Tennessee. Oh, and there's also one more resource in the way of native plants for Tennessee. Um, there is a great native plants for Tennessee database. And Andrea, the easiest way for me to always find that is to go the, to the Tennessee Smart Yards website. So that's how I always direct people to get there. Go to Tennessee Smart Yards website, and then you'll see right there on the homepage, it says native plant database. And you just click on that. Um, and it's got picture, it's a picture database and it's got common and scientific names, short descriptions, it's super helpful. So if you're trying to get more familiar with native plants, that'd be a great place to start too. Absolutely. And the, the master gardener who's been putting that together kind of like as a blog also has a lot of narrative about like how to use the plants, how to use the native plants. And she's gone to through leaps and bounds to make sure that all the plants she's included there are somewhat readily available, either through a local nursery in Tennessee or through mail order from a regionally, you know, native um, uh, provider. So good resource. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much.